I just want to show you a couple photos of some famous tennis players and just kind of curious as to your response. Oh, what was that? Jeez. Okay. Aesthetics are good. The aesthetics are good. Do you like that? That's a nice way of saying she's nude. If I looked like that, I'd be very happy. That's yeah. the best I got. You like the sides of his racket? Well, you can't see the full racket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. racket. Yeah. <laughs> But she's not going to play tennis in that outfit. So are you guys big tennis fans? Decent tennis yeah, fans? Yeah. You would do a picture like this? Yeah. Oh. You know, she's got two balls in that hand. Is that deliberate? <laughs> yeah. This is Isner. Oh, and all his oh, Isner is. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Wow. Nice. Thanks. That is what? Thomas Burditch. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. Well, he's naked. <laughs> We all look a little different when we're naked. So let me ask you, yeah. who else would you like to see in here that I haven't shown you? Songa. Songa, that's a good choice. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's a sleeper Songa. right there. I'd like to see, I'd like to see Fedris though in that. Oh, she oh, her, right. she good. You better get her. her. Please, Please, get naked Sam in front of the camera. Stoza. Everyone wants that. Yep. But here's your love. So as you can see, I have a pretty cool job. I get to talk about naked people for a living. Actually, uh, as, as you know, I was at Wimbledon, and it took about two days for us to interview as many different people to compose that little snippet. It took the editors like another two days to kind of put together that minute and a half snippet of content right there. I wanted to open up with that piece because as we know, we're here to talk about work, and as a journalist, I'm here to tell you what it's like to work as a journalist. And I just wanted you to see that in a minute and a half clip, probably took about 72 hours for us to put together. So to work like a journalist means to work your ass off and to work relentlessly for the small, minute amount of information that you guys all get to see. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and I was blessed to be able to read the brilliant work of Mitch Album. How many of you are familiar with Mitch Album's work? Well, I knew Mitch before he was talking about heaven and Maury and everyone else. I was reading Mitch when he was just a reporter for the Detroit Free Press, and I would read his columns every day. Now, I would tell you that we grew up really poor, and we didn't have the 25 to 30 cents to buy a fresh newspaper every day, and so I would literally read newspapers that were left on the buses just so I can see his words. When I got to college, I started working for the Western Herald at Western Michigan University. Any Michiganders out there? Any Broncos? Yes, let's say it with pride. Don't be all shy with it. Again. Yes, Broncos. At Western Michigan University, we're so, you know, somewhat of a small school. Obviously, a lot of you hadn't heard of it. But I had this crazy idea. I was working in the sports department, and I thought, you know, no one's really reading us. We gotta go out and find reasons for people to really read us. And I was with my buddies, and we were watching the basketball game. We were watching the Detroit Pistons, and it was Grant Hill's rookie year. And I said to my buddies, I said, I'm going to interview Grant Hill. Then everybody's going to pick up that paper and read it. And my buddy looked at me and was like, are you crazy? We're, we're the Western Herald at Western Michigan University. Grant Hill, at the time, was the biggest name in the NBA. In fact, he ended up having more all-star votes his rookie year than any other veteran that season. He was a giant star. And my buddy just looked at me and said, you are crazy. There is no way you're going to get Grant Hill to talk to us. So I was like, watch. The next day, I went to the Western Herald's office. I picked up the telephone. I called the Detroit Pistons. And I said, hi there. My name is LZ Granderson. I'm with the Western Herald at Western Michigan University. And I would like to schedule an interview with Grant Hill. They kind of paused. Where are you from? The Western Herald, sir. It's like, OK. Um, why don't you call us back tomorrow? <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I hung up the phone. My buddies were like, well, what happened? They said they told him to call back tomorrow. So what did I do the next day? I called them back. Hi there, this is LZ Granderson with the Western Herald. Yes. I would like to schedule an interview with Grant Hill. Uh, who is this? LZ Granderson with the Western Herald. <laughs> yeah, why don't you try calling us back tomorrow? That happened for three weeks. Every single day for three weeks, I called the Detroit Pistons to schedule an interview with Grant Hill. 
Then one day I called, hi there, this is LG Grant. I said, oh, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. Look, we got you tickets, we got you credentials. Come down on this day, you can interview Grant Hill for 20 minutes. I wore that sucker down. <laughs> the story gets better. I didn't have a car. Didn't have a credit card. And even if I had a credit card, I was too young to rent a car. So now I finally got my chance to interview Grant Hill, but he's on the other side of the state and I don't have a car. So I talked to all my buddies. We pulled together because we were broke college students. We all threw in all the money we had and we bought gas for the one guy who had a car that was decent enough to make it across the state. We all chipped in, we drove over. In order for us to, to, to make this all happen, we had to get special permission from like the president because we were going on like special university business. It was really, really crazy. But we got back, not only did we have an interview with Grant Hill, but we also got Allen Houston and a couple other players and we ended up doing a week long series on the Detroit Pistons, all because of tenaciousness. And I've been tenacious like that my entire career. And I've been really, really fortunate that that tenaciousness has led me to work for two of the biggest media companies on the planet. Now with that comes a lot of responsibility. With that comes a lot of pressure. I travel a great deal. You saw me there at Wimbledon. That's a three, two to three week trip to fly there beforehand, do your reporting, be there for a two week tournament and then fly home. There are four major tournaments in tennis. If you do the math, that's looking like at three months of which I'm already gone. And that's just for tenants for ESPN. I also work for CNN. So I have to fly back and forth from Washington, DC. I have to fly back and forth to Ferguson, which I've been to quite a few times over these past two months. I am constantly, constantly on the go, being that tenacious. And what I wanted to share with you was not my tenaciousness, but what not having work-life balance did to me because of it. One day I was sitting in the barber. I was getting my sideburns worked on. And I started to break out in a sweat. And I started to get dizzy. And I told my stylist, I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. They called the ambulance, the ambulance picked me up, scooted me to the hospital, ran an EKG, and true enough, I was having signs of a heart attack. They rushed me in for the emergency surgery, exploratory surgery to see what was going on. Thankfully it wasn't, it was another medical condition. But in the conversation with my physician, he asked me, are you under a lot of stress? And I just looked at him like, well, of course I'm under a lot of stress. He said, when the last time you had a vacation? I was like, what do you mean by vacation? He said, like a week off. I said, I don't know, maybe three years. He looked at me and said, what are you doing? I was like, I'm working. I have to do this in order to maintain the positions that I have. If I don't do this, then I won't be where I'm at. If I don't have my phone on with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week, tweeting, reading, then the world will end. I have to do this. And he told me literally that if you keep at this pace, the next time you come in here, it won't be just a scare. So this past week, I took that to heart by the way, pun intended. This past week, I had three possible stories to pursue. In San Francisco, Cleve Jones, who is a contemporary of Harvey Milk, and he also was the founder and creator of the AIDS quilt, was having a fundraiser in San Francisco and to mark his 60th birthday. Now, that would have been a great story for me to go and cover. In the city of Denver, the Matthew Shepard Foundation was honoring Jason Collins. Matthew Shepard, the young man in 1998 who died after being beaten and left to die in a hate crime in Wyoming. Great story for me to cover. This weekend in Ferguson, we know about the three days of protests and riots, and I have been, not riots, but just protests, and I've been down there multiple times, and I should have gone back down there to write what was happening at that moment. That would have been a great story for me to write. Instead, I stayed home and celebrated my friend's 40th birthday. I was looking at this photo and I started adding it up and I've known these people for a combined 80 years of my life. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, yeah, it would have been great for me to go and cover these different stories, but I gotta have work-life balance. 
And as a journalist, especially one who works for these type of media companies, it is so easy to get so caught up in writing about and telling the stories of everyone else that you forget to live your own life. So if there's anything that I can share with you about my experience about what it means to work as a journalist, it's not to get so caught up in your work that you forget to celebrate the benefits of your work. There's a running joke that talks about this guy who has like this fantastic house and this fantastic car and this fantastic uh, uh, j private jet and he gets to use none of it because he's always at work so he can afford to pay for the fantastic house and the fantastic car and the fantastic jet. And you ask yourself, what kind of life is that? Now, granted I had the health scare and I've gotten a little bit better about my work-life balance, but still sometimes I forget that I do need to do that balance. And an exercise that I would do with myself is I would actually turn down the lights. I will shut off my phone. And I will actually begin to meditate on this one particular song. All these years, God, what have I done? The mistakes have made, and there's more than one. And I can't help but wonder if I can let it be. Keep looking back on this wounded heart Tears my mind in two and my soul apart But it's over now Time for me to move on So let it go organization estimates that American businesses lose $300 billion every year because of work-life stress. People call in sick. People get long-term illnesses because of working too much and not taking time to let themselves relax and to breathe. I was fortunate. I didn't have a heart attack that day, and I got the message. So I encourage you, I encourage you all, don't forget the person who matters the most. Yes, you may be a CEO, you want to be CEO, you may want to be partner, but none of that ultimately is going to matter if you don't have your health to go along with that. <laughs>